Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for those joining us online. Uh, Happy New Year and, and Merry Christmas still. We're, we're still celebrating Christmas today. We get to sing uh, Christmas songs again. Uh, next week we'll be celebrating uh, the season and beginning the season of Epiphany leading on into Lent. Before we know it, it's going to be Ash Wednesday already uh, and the year will be a third of the way through. So thank you for joining us. Our, our gospel for today comes from Luke, the second chapter, and it's the story of teenage Jesus and his family on their pilgrimage for the Passover. And uh, the focus of the message today is going to be Jesus' statement about, you know what, I had to be in my father's house about my father's business and how we can incorporate that into our lives of faith to be about the business of the Lord. So if you're able, I invite you to stand for our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, you search us out and you know us, and all that we are is open to you. We confess that we have sinned. In your mercy, Lord, forgive us and heal us. When we make no room for Christ, and when we fail to welcome him into our daily lives, in your mercy, Lord, forgive us and heal us. When we follow shooting stars and when we squander our gifts in Herod's court. In your mercy, Lord, forgive us and heal us. When we forget that you were born in a dirty stable among the poor of the world. In your mercy, Lord, forgive us and heal us. When we sing sweet sentiments over Christ's birth, yet fail to rejoice over his everyday presence. In your mercy, Lord, forgive us and heal us. We turn to you, O Christ, perfect union of spirit and flesh. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Christ our Lord was born today, forever ending our bondage to sin 
and death. Hear the good news. Through Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as our Lord Jesus Christ confessed that he was going to be about the Father's business in the Father's house, help us, dear Lord, to incorporate that into our own lives by dwelling in your word and going out into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from 1 Kings 3, 4 through 15. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father. Because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him for this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. Who, who, who is able to govern this, this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life of riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked you for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have to obtain an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 119, and it's 176 verses, so it's kind of hard to summarize the whole psalm. It just is so expansive. But I think you'll, you'll notice that these few verses we're going to be responsively reading today it talks about the law of God, God's commandments, God's testimony, his precepts, his rules, his word. It, you know, it's this focus on we who have already been redeemed and sanctified, this is what we direct our lives to, God's word. Please join me. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. 
Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you'd please stand for the gospel, which we read this morning from Luke, the second chapter. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among the relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor of God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to join me as we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may your word be on our head, on our hearts, and on our lips. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's, it's cl as close to New Year's as we can get for worship service, I suppose, so that means we have to talk about resolutions a little bit. Um, and I, Alicia, I got, a, I got some head shaking on that one. Yeah, you know, we'll just talk about them, right? It, it's fun to talk about uh, how quickly uh, they get filed into the uh, round file, which is our trash cans in our homes. And, uh, but just to kind of a couple thoughts before we begin. Um, you know, I've been sick this whole past week. Uh, it's, it's a tradition in my life that every winter I get this bronchitis chest infection. And uh, now just so you know, I've been tested for COVID twice this week. I don't have it, right? It's definitely not. Um, and, and it's a result of, as a child, I had a near drowning, I actually did drown uh, incident. And uh, um, from four to 12, I'd gotten this terrible chest cold every year. And finally, the pediatrician told my mom it was probably a result of damage to my lungs because of that. But interestingly, since I became a pastor, almost to the day after Christmas, I get sick every year. So there's, I don't think that's a coincidence, right? It's like, you know, God's helping me out, and then after Christmas, he's like, okay, go rest. So I had a very restful week, uh, lots of sleeping, um, uh, lots of, well, I say television watching, but it was more sleeping while the television was on, you know how that goes. And so that's kind of where my thoughts this last week, but as well, and I, and I want to, um, as, as some of you may, may know already, um, we lost two saints um, of the church, if you will, these past few weeks. Uh, both Fred and Beryl Eirer passed away. Uh, Fred passed away December 14th, and 11 days later, Beryl passed away on Christmas Day. And so uh, the family's going to be having a private graveside ceremony uh, this week, um, but your prayers to their families. But I can tell you, I've spoken to them, and... Uh, a truly a testament to the, the, the foundational Christian belief that, that we do grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. It, it's hope through tears, um, because Fred and Beryl are at rest in the Lord, and that's something that we can certainly celebrate, even though it brings a tear to our eye. But as I warned, uh, a little talk on resolutions and, and I'll tell you, and I read this, um, this was a few years ago. A lot of times I take notes on things and uh, little quotes I write, and I don't always write down dates, but I believe this is one I stumbled on a few years ago. And it's this, the ultimate resolution a Christian can make is to live in the light of divine intentions. So that's our ultimate Christmas, or our ultimate New Year's resolution, is that we live in the light of divine intentions. So let me speak a little bit more about that. Um, what, you know, it's kind of fun in a way to play with the, the brand new possibilities of the new year. Um, you know, today's January 3rd, so if you went for a walk yesterday, you've exercised 33% of the year. That's pretty good. It's all how you think about it, right? Um, get, if you got through lunch without eating potato chips or a candy bar, then your whole diet this year reflects sort of a healthy lifestyle. Maybe you haven't cussed at anyone or, or yelled at someone, or thrown your dirty clothes on the bathroom floor, or forgotten to read your Bible in the morning. And if you haven't, even if you have, have not or done one of those things in the last three days, you're 33%. That's 330. If you were playing a baseball player, you'd be getting a million bucks a year. On January 3rd, your whole life can be transformed for at least a few days, maybe a few hours. Okay, maybe a few minutes. This year, we could say, is a perfect reflection of my best self. But the problem is January 3rd is followed by January 4th and January 5th. Someday soon, we'll opt for staying in our bed instead of plunging out into the cold for that morning walk. Pretty soon, candy wrappers start appearing in our pants pockets, in our coats pockets, in our desk drawers. By the fourth or the fifth, you're going to be aggravated enough with either a bad driver or a dropped glass, or maybe you stub your pinky toe like I did. And that's the worst, right? When you just catch your pinky toe on, on a chair or something, and all of a sudden, a streak of bad words or unsanctified thoughts fill your mind. And then by the seventh of the month, uh, your socks are back on the floor, uh, and you have slept most of the day without opening the Bible and you've said uh, enough cuss words to fill a swear jar to the top. So for all but a few of us, most New Year's resolutions get packed away when we pack away the Christmas decorations. 
by Epiphany, which we celebrate next Sunday, our behavior and the whole new year are as tarnished as they were on January 3rd. And I remember this Calvin and Hobbes comic where Calvin and Hobbes are, um, and, and you probably know Calvin has his pet tiger who sort of is, is real to him, and they're walking and Calvin says to his friend, he says, you know, I'm sick of the new year because, you know, it just seems everything just repeats, nothing changes. And Hobbes responds, as well, he says, the problem is the past keeps becoming the present. Past keeps becoming the present. And I think another problem with most of our New Year's resolutions, and you know, we can make a list, and now don't get me wrong, New Year's resolutions are a great thing. It's a great time to reflect. But one of the problems is, is that our resolutions are usually too safe, and they're too sensible, and they're too self-interested. It's all about me. You know, maybe we resolve to make sort of tiny cosmetic changes in our lifestyle, but refuse to consider really restructuring our lives, changing the models by which we live. Luke's single story about the boy Jesus, I think, offers us a very good example of what it would mean if we were to truly transform our lives by making that ultimate resolution, which of course is to live in the light of divine intentions. That our resolution this year is to declare that from this time forward, I will be about the Father's business. Now to our gospel reading, Joseph and Mary, their friends and their neighbors and their relatives from Nazareth, all made the required pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. But as soon as the allotted time for the holiday had ended, they hit the road, I, my guess is very anxious to get back home to all the chores and the responsibilities that filled their lives. Joseph was a craftsman working with stone and wood, undoubtedly had projects waiting for him. Mary would have had the hundreds of time-consuming tasks it took to keep her family fed and clothed. Um, I think all of us can understand after that extended vacation and, and, the, and maybe even the days right up to when it's over, we're very much looking back to getting back to the comfortability of home and sort of back to the tasks that have been left undone. Now, it's just interesting to note that it's here in, in Luke's gospel is the last mention of Joseph. Um, and most scholars assume that he died sometime before Jesus began his public ministry. And, and one of the evidences for this is at the wedding of Cana, which we read about in John chapter 2, Joseph is conspicuously absent. Uh, and we see Mary there, but no mention of Joseph. And some scholars have even posited that one of the reasons, aside from divine will, but that Jesus remained at home until he was 30, was the care of his family. We can't know that, but it's an interesting thought. So back to our story from the gospel. Um, what we find is in their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, we see the young Jesus refusing to let his relationship with God be regulated according to the culturally imposed schedule. Instead of going along with the return to business as usual attitude, Jesus answered the most important call of all. And that was to be about the father's business in the father's house. And what would it mean? And what would it look like if you and I were to act in a similar fashion? What would it mean to live not according to human expectations or cultural patterns, but according to what God has required of us? And Psalm 119, those verses we read, is a great summary of what God does require of us. What does it mean to be about God's business rather than other people's business? Or even other people's definitions of God's business? And what Jesus discovered at, at this early age was that answering God's expectations can get you in trouble. Especially with your own family. In fact, focusing on God's business may put an unexpected crimp in the family business. Business as usual may not be the way God does it. And I'll tell you, when you do step out in faith, 
oftentimes the world and the church find that unnerving. And, and, and just by way of example, not to s select anyone individually, but the last couple months anyway, I've, I've noticed some interesting things happening. Um, you know, a number of people uh, either sharing with me on Facebook or in private conversations how they have kind of stepped out in faith in kind of doing a new thing. And I think, you know, one of the opportunities that the pandemic brings, if you will, and I don't mean to say it's a good thing because these are things are happening, but there's opportunity. You know, uh, there's opportunity, more opportunity right now for the church to step forward and to be there, not only financially, but spiritually for people in need th than ever before. In, in some ways, it's kind of an exciting time. Challenging, but exciting. And, and you know, I've heard a number of stories in the last few months of people sort of stepping out, um, you know, and m maybe they've opened their home to strangers, or maybe they've focused more times on an inner city uh, ministry. You know, those are just a couple examples. And in response, people who they care and love for have said things like, well, be careful. Do you know what you're getting yourself into? I don't know. I would do that if I were you. Now, that might be very good advice. Don't get me wrong. But the point is this. When you step out in faith to be about the Father's business, that will oftentimes contradict the world's business. And you're going to get the warners and the naysayers and the people telling you to be careful. Not to mean you shouldn't be careful, but don't let your fear and other people's expectations get in the way of the Father's business. Jesus didn't. I mean, kind of rather rudely, he responded to Mary when she said, you know, where have you been? It's been three days we've been looking for you. And his point was, you know, didn't you know I had to be doing what I'm doing? I had to be in the Father's house about the Father's business. So what does... The Christian, how do we, who have resolved to be part of God's transforming work on January 3rd, do on Monday, January the 4th? How do we begin this process? Well, I think there are two simple and brief requirements. And the first is that we go deeply into the word, and then the second is we go bravely into the world. Deep in the word into the world. You know, when Jesus, the young Jesus, felt called to live beyond the expectations of this world, answering the call of the Father's business, this example we get of the teenager Jesus, he first went to the temple. And you know what? You know, I, I think it's also an example here of how the church can really respond to youth. Now, I, I don't want to say, you know, we have a young Jesus in our congregation. That's not what I'm getting at. But the point is, the church listened. They listened. They paid attention. They were interested. And, you know, I think that becomes a challenge for the church as well and our own youth ministries. You know, are we listening to them? Are we interested? And they sat there. And, of course, they were marveling at his wisdom. And the Pharisees and the scribes, you know, maybe even the same men who 18 years later are going to be calling for his death, we don't know. But in that moment, they were amazed at his wisdom and at his teachings. But Jesus was right where he needed to be, in the Father's house, in his word. So if that's the first part of a New Year's resolution, to live in the divine light, the second is this, going out into the world. That being about God's business doesn't mean we do nothing, but sit in church all day discussing theology. You know, Jesus started out in the temple, but then he obediently followed Joseph and Mary back into the world. You know, Luke makes a point, and he was submissive to his parents. We cannot be part of transforming the world unless we stand in its midst. Now, I, I'll tell you, I'm not making any sort of what I would consider to be overreaching goals here. You know, part of our mission at St. Martin is to show Christ's love to the people we come in contact with and to transform lives in Christ and to make a difference in our community. And that idea of transforming lives in Christ, you know, we as a church have embraced that as part of our individual specific mission. 
And in order to do that, we dig into God's word, and then we get out into the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, a fresh new year lies unblemished before us. Help us, dear Lord, to commit ourselves to the ultimate resolution. To live in the light of your divine intentions and not our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd please stand. And let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that your Son, the eternal Word, became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of grace and truth. Extend his praise into all the world that many more with us would come to hope in his steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son diligently heard the word of God and grew in wisdom and stature, submissive to his earthly parents and always about your business and in your house. 
Keep the families of your church abiding in your word, eager to be found among those. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us in Christ, your beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins. Preserve your church by the preaching of the gospel of salvation and the seal of the promised Holy Spirit in baptism. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you gave your servant Solomon unsurpassed wisdom to rule your people Israel, chiefly the wisdom that begins in fearing you. Give to the leaders and elected officials of our nation wisdom for their task to discern between good and evil and to govern this people in peace. Be gracious to preserve our president, our president-elect, our governor, and all legislatures and judges. Lord, in your mercy, give patience and endurance to all who are sick or in any need, especially Marie and Kathy, Carrie, Ron and Donna, Heather and Stella Marie, Jim and Randy, Mike and Kirsten, Laura and Natalie, and anyone we name silently or aloud before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, strengthen the saints on earth as we remember those who have gone to join you in the church triumphant. We remember this morning Fred and Beryl Eirer. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We unite our hearts as we sing the prayer our Lord has taught us. Please be seated for our closing
good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for worship this morning here at St. Martin. Uh, if you're online or here, hopefully the service bulletin is av available uh, for these updates and reminders. Um, for our uh, members and guests, uh, visitors or guests here this morning at the church. Uh, it is the first Sunday of January. It is a communion Sunday. So if you take a moment, look at the bottom of the second page in the inside of the service bulletin, you'll see our statement of belief about the Lord's Supper. Please read through that. If you share that belief about the sacrament, you're welcome to join us for the Lord's Supper this morning. Otherwise, we ask that you use that time for prayer and meditation or come up and receive a blessing. Just let us know. And if you would need us to bring communion to, to you, uh, you can let the ushers know as they dismiss you. Uh, please continue to check our website, stmartinbertrand.org. We'll have updates, as I mentioned, the service bulletin. And with the service bulletin, we have the little news and notes sheet there also. Uh, the schedule's in there for this upcoming week as life somewhat goes back to normal. Even though we're still in the season of Christmas getting ready for Epiphany, uh, we go back to our regular worship schedule and meeting schedules and things like that that we can. Uh, there are still opportunities to grow and to serve. Uh, just to remind you, opportunities to grow, whether it's uh, Faith Weavers or the new member orientation, that information's there in the news and notes. Um, and then opportunities to serve. Uh, we do have the after next Sunday, Epiphany Sunday, uh, the undecorating of the church, um, but also Franklin Avenue Missions coming up this month for us to help there also. Uh, so those opportunities are there to go on. Also, you'll see information in there about uh, our potential to get to know each other uh, by name and face a little better through the picture pictorial directory and that information's in there also uh, this will be the second Friday of January so we will have a fish fry uh, there are flyers Karen mentioned there are flyers available uh, with information back at the welcome center for uh, that so once again thank you for joining us God's blessings on your day and on your week